Grace and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are glad to be gathered for worship with you this day. I have just a few announcements for the life of First Presbyterian Church. First off, though, I just want to say thank you to the congregation and to those of y'all who were patient and uh, willing to participate in our first ever Zoom congregational meeting last week. It actually went really smoothly, along with, of course, our live worship at Dogwood Park, which we will continue next month in November, the second Sunday. But thanks, y'all. I appreciate your willingness to do a new thing. So this morning, we have a couple announcements. First is that on October 25th, so next Sunday, uh, from three until five, we'll have our next six foot social. This time it will occur at Amazing Acres, just down the road. And this is an intergenerational church-wide event. So whether you plan to go in the maze or not, please come and we'll enjoy some fellowship time together. Uh, they do have food available for purchase there and we will gather in fellowship. Uh, also, another exciting new development is that starting in November, so just around the corner, on Sundays from 3 till 5 p.m., our Ignite Youth Group will be meeting. We primarily are going to try to meet outdoors when possible, but we will always do our meetings in a way that is safe. Um, but that is coming up in November, Sundays 3 to 5. And let us know if you have any questions about that. Let us now prepare to worship the Lord. Exalt the Almighty and worship at God's holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. Look, the Lord draws near. Come into the presence of the Holy One. Let us behold the glory of our God. 
When we stand in the presence of the Holy One, we recognize the ways our lives fall short of the glory of God. But still, God draws near to us in mercy and in grace. Therefore, with confidence, let us present our whole selves before the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Living Lord, in you we live and move and have our being. You call us to give all that we are and all that we have in service to Christ. Christ, have mercy. But we hold tightly to our treasure, afraid we will not have enough for ourselves and hold back our talents, afraid these gifts will not be enough. Lord, have mercy. God, unclench our fists and help us to give fully and freely so that in all things we might serve and glorify you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, says the Lord, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Take heart, for the Lord chooses to be gracious to us. Indeed, we have found favor in God's sight. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Good morning, young disciples. I'm glad that y'all are all gathered in front of a television or a computer somewhere watching and participating in worship today. I'm really glad y'all are here. This coming week, y'all be headed back to school, which will be exciting. A new adventure awaits for y'all in the classroom. Uh, but today, I wanted to stop and talk a little bit about this one of our scriptures today. The scripture says, give to the emperor what is the emperor's and give to God what is God's. It's kind of an interesting, but it's hard to understand scripture. It's from Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. And what was going on was that there were people asking Jesus if they needed to pay taxes. And I don't know if y'all know very much about taxes, but taxes is something that we give money to the government for them to be able to help us protect us and help us in other ways. And so back then they had taxes too. Um, I've always loved the movie, the Disney movie, Robin Hood. And if y'all haven't seen it, y'all should stop and watch it. Um, but you get a good understanding of what it was like a lot, a long time ago when you were poor and you were trying to pay taxes because a lot of them, by the time they gave gover the government all of their money, they didn't have anything left to eat and they didn't have any money left to buy clothing or to put a roof over their head. And so taxes are really, really difficult for them. Um, and you get to see that some in the movie Robin Hood. So I suggest that y'all read that. But um, they were mad and upset and they asked Jesus, they said, "What are we? are we supposed to pay taxes or not? Jesus is pretty smart, and he picked up the coin and looked at it. And if y'all look at a coin today, you will see a coin in the United States has pictures of presidents from in history. But if you pick up a coin from the United Kingdom, from Britain, um, England, London, you will see a picture of the queen. And it's the queen that is alive right now today. 
their reigning queen. And back then, when Jesus picked up that a coin, the coin had a picture of the emperor on it, of the person that was ruling right then. And so he looked at it and he said, give to the emperor, what is the emperor's? The emperor's face was on it. And he was like, this, the money, the stuff of this world, he said, give to the emperor what's his. So his picture was on it and give it to him. He said, but give to God what is God's. And where, what is God's? What belongs to God? Our hearts belong to God. So we need to give, we pay our taxes and we give to our government what belongs to the government, whether or not we think it's right. But we save those parts of us that belong to God, our heart and our mind, and the kind things that we do for others. We give those parts of us, we do those things for God. And so it's reminding us that there are things on this earth like paying taxes that are just not fun, but they're of this earth. They belong on earth, but they're things that belong with God. Things that are better and more important than the coin with the emperor's face on it. The things that are in our hearts, the things that show kindness to others, the things that show love to each other and to God. And to make sure that you reserve those things for God, that our heart doesn't belong to our country. Our heart belongs to God. Um, and so I hope y'all remember that. Take a chance to watch Robin Hood. It's a good, fun movie and something maybe that'd be fun to end fall break with. But um, remember to reserve the things that are, are of God for God. Would y'all bow your heads with me and let's pray. Y'all repeat what I repeat, you knew it. Dear God, Thank you for today and thank you for fall break. Please help us remember what belongs to God, our hearts and our love and to give those things back to God. In Jesus name, Amen. Y'all have a good week at school. Bye. Let us pray. Sovereign God, let your word rule in our hearts and your spirit govern our lives until at last we see the fulfillment of your realm of justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 through 7. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I the Lord do all these things. Our second scripture lesson is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you 
because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution you received, the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Acacia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Keep these words in your heart. The Lord is God, the Lord alone. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Our gospel lesson this morning continues our journey through Matthew. We are in the 22nd chapter verses 15 through 22. Matthew 22, 15 through 22. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I read here this week's gospel lesson from the gospel according to Matthew, I can't help but also hear a song from one of my favorite contemporary poets and prophets, Robert Zimney, otherwise known as Bob Dylan. Particularly, I hear the song, You Gotta Serve Somebody. It says, you may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're gonna have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Gotta serve somebody, it was the lead song on Dylan's 1979 album, titled Slow Train Coming. It was his last hit single. It won a Grammy for best male vocal for that year. The song also marked Dylan's conversion to Christianity from Judaism. Thought of this song, studying and preparing out of the gospel here. 
This gospel text from Matthew, which includes Jesus' oft-quoted words, responding to that gotcha trick question the Pharisees and the Herodians posed. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. So like all of these recent passages that we've been hearing out of this gospel, and really like all of scripture, it is helpful coming to the text to have some sense of the surrounding context, the background, some explanation as we unpack this story. To begin with, Jews in the first century Palestine paid a lot of taxes. There was a temple tax. There were also land taxes, customs and trade taxes, just to name some more. Now the tax in particular in today's passage was an additional tax, and it was one that was particularly despised by the Jews. This tax was called the imperial tax, and it was required as a tribute to Rome to support the Roman Empire's occupation of Israel. So think of that for just a moment, right? First century Jews were required to pay their oppressors a yearly tax to support their own occupation. Now, as with lots of matters in life, not everyone saw the tax that way. The Herodians were actually local sympathizers with the Roman rulers. They were a family political party related to King Herod, hence their name. The local puppet propped up ruler who was supported by the Romans. Some folks think that Paul may have actually come from this same family. The Herodians supported the imperial tax. They benefited directly from it. The Pharisees, also a sort of political party, as well as, of course, religious scholars, they didn't have much use for the imperial tax, but likely grudgingly supported it since it also helped to maintain their power. As oft has been said, politics makes for strange bedfellows and people will do any number of things to maintain power. Now, as far as Matthew is concerned, the Pharisees would do anything to try and trap Jesus. Now, this imperial tax was opposed by most, if not all, of Jesus' followers. Many of them were, in fact, nationalists who found this imperial tax particularly offensive as it every single day served as a reminder of their humiliation, their occupation by the Roman Empire. Now, this imperial tax should have been a problem for the Pharisees. It absolutely should have been. And not just for political reasons. For a coin engraved with a picture of the emperor Caesar Tiberius and a proclamation of his divinity, that was a direct and clear-cut violation of not just the first commandment, but the first two commandments. And so in Jesus' time, like so many topics today in our time, any conversation about politics and this imperial tax was very divisive and immediately would reveal where one stood in relation to Rome and faith. And that is how the Herodians and the Pharisees ended up together trying to trap Jesus. Normally, these groups would not get along, but on this occasion, they were united 
in their misguided attempts to trap Jesus. Jesus had just entered Jerusalem. The people loved him. Now Jesus is preaching in the temple and stirring up all kinds of trouble for these folks simply trying to maintain the status quo. And so together, the Herodians and the Pharisees decide that they are going to get him. They're going to trap him. And with their question here about the imperial tax, Jesus' foes think they have him right where they want him. If Jesus answered one way, if he advocated paying this tax, well, then he would disappoint his followers. If Jesus answered another way, if he advocated not paying this tax, well, then he would be in trouble with the Roman rulers. They thought they had him for sure. But Jesus not only evaded their trap, he trapped them in their own question. Whose face is on the coin, he asks. Perhaps over eager to advance their own plot, Jesus' opponents forgot that by showing a coin with the emperor's image, they betrayed their own complicity in the Roman system. Then Jesus asked whose image and proclamation adorn, adorned the coin. The emperor's, they answered. And everyone in attendance knew the commandments. They would know them well. And they knew that Jesus had just trapped the trappers in their own blasphemy, according to their very own law. And that makes Jesus' response even more biting. Give therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. As he oft does, Jesus turns the tables on his foes. With just a few words, Jesus revealed the truth about his would-be accusers, and simultaneously called them to higher accountability and fidelity than they likely had even imagined possible. And so that brings us back to Dylan's song. That's where Dylan comes in. You got to serve somebody. Jesus made it absolutely clear who he served that day. And so I wonder, might Jesus also be asking us? Might Jesus also be talking to us? He's not trapping us, but he is inviting us to declare our ultimate allegiance to God and God alone. So the key question here is not whose image is on the coin, but rather whose image is on us. Whose image is on our hearts? Whose image shapes our coming and our going, our rising and our lying down? Jesus is inviting us in this difficult, divided season of election and debate. Jesus is inviting us to declare our allegiance, not to a flag, not to a political party, certainly not to a politician. Jesus is inviting us to declare our allegiance to Almighty God. Now, often this passage is interpreted in a way that presents the dichotomy in our lives, that we have duties both to God and country. And while there is certainly some truth to that, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking up here about our duty to God. Now, surely lots of us have strong political and theological views. And with all the labels and allegiances that come along with them. But before and certainly above any of these, we, you and I, are Christians. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus is, or should be, our first and deepest loyalty above all others. 
Jesus raises important questions for us in this passage, and he does not give pat answers. There are elements in our lives that are indeed part of the world order and should be rendered to Caesar, as the passage states. But there are other parts of our lives, core parts of life, our very being, the center of our very selves that belong to God alone. And if we remember that, all of life takes on greater focus and meaning. We belong not to anything or anyone in this world. We belong to God. And this means that no matter what we may do or say, no matter where we may go, no matter what may happen to us, we are first and foremost and forever God's own beloved children. All of us. So to believe this and, and to live this, that then places us in a posture, not of triumphalism, not of superiority, no. It places us in a posture of gratitude. It is in and through this posture of gratitude that God will shape all that we say, what we do, what we, how we live. We belong to God, God's beloved children. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. We know who we serve. I pray we are loyal to that calling and to that calling above all. For all of life belongs to God. And so render unto God the things that are God's. That is to live a life marked, not by the many, many ways we humans divide and belittle one another. If all of life is God's, and you gotta serve somebody, we, you and I, we gratefully serve and love and live in the love and rule of Jesus Christ and none other. We belong to God, God's children, all of us. Our task is to believe that and to live it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now let us join together in singing our sermon hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Let us pray. To the Lord, our God, Alpha and Omega, be all glory and honor forever. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith as we share together in saying a portion of the Confession of 1967. The life 
death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on the inhumanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences of the church's own complicity in injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of human life in society and of God's victory over all wrong. The church follows this pattern in the form of its life and in the method of its action. So to live and serve is to confess Christ as Lord. Friends, may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. is the time when we lift up our celebrations and our concerns, those that we have spoken or posted or texted or shared, and those that we have not. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are our shepherd and you satisfy our needs. In faith, we pray to you, Lord, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for the church. Make us steadfast in our love and our service, remembering your people in our prayers and giving thanks to you in all things. Lord God, we pray for the earth. Let the whole earth sing a new song to you, a song of redemption, of gladness and joy, a song of thanksgiving for your saving grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for all nations and peoples. In every place, anoint faithful leaders, those who know your name, those who seek your will, those who share your love of justice and peace. Lord God, we pray for this community Break down these walls that divide us. Bend the bars that imprison us in fear. Open the doors that lead to new life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for our loved ones. Speak your powerful word of healing to those who are hurting. Give courage to those who are afraid. Let your grace and peace be known to all. Lord, hear us now as we lift up the celebrations and concerns of this community of faith and beyond. Hear our prayer, Lord, for Ron Ledbetter and for his family and friends as they grieve the death of Uncle Glenn. Lord, hear our prayers for the Sadler family. Almighty God, hear our prayers for Doc Stone, for Rachel. Lord, hear our prayers for healing for Donna, for Sydney. Hear our prayer, Lord, for Gladys and for Amy and their family for healing and strength. Hear our prayers, Lord, for Lou Richards, for Grace Anna. We continue to lift up prayers for Sue Rich, 
for Jeremy Goodson. Hear our prayer, Lord, for Mike and Beverly, for Angelo and Jeanette. Lord, for all of those affected by COVID, we pray for strength and for healing. Hear our prayer for Barbara and for her dad, Don. We pray for strength. Hear our prayers for Judy and for David. Lord, hear our prayer giving you thanks for caregivers and lifting up particular concerns for those living with Alzheimer's and dementia. Hear our prayer, Lord, for Amanda and for John. Hear our prayer, Lord, for Nancy and for Vicki. Lord, we thank you for those who serve on behalf of others. Hear our prayer for Jacob Carr and for Josh Cavalli. Lord, for all of those in the wake of the Delta storm, we pray for the rebuilding, for strength. Hear our prayers for David Robertson and for their family as he endures lack of power for weeks possibly. We pray, Lord, continued prayers for the orphanage, the staff, and the residents in Lesotho. Loving shepherd, lead us and guide us in green pastures and by still waters, in right paths and through dark valleys, until we feast with you in glory and dwell in your house forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, friends, I appeal to you to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, as we lift up the offerings and the fruit of our labor to the Lord.
God of the harvest, you continually plant seeds of your love in our world and in our lives. As we bring our gifts to you, may they be seeds of your grace, peace, and hope planted deeply in our community. Amen. And now may we all rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you.